I very much see uh, my job as as doing what you just said, which is kind of taking timeless, very important ideas and translating them in such a way that they're accessible uh, to the person who is never going to go to the philosophy section of a bookstore. I was thinking, have you read a Tennessee Williams essay, uh, The Catastrophe of Success? I have not. I think you would like it. It's really interesting. His, his, his point was that like life without struggle is meaningless and that mm -hmm. one of the problems of success is that it removes a lot of the day-to-day -day struggle, right? He's like, suddenly you're not cleaning up after yourself. Suddenly you're not, you know, uh, necessarily as motivated because you don't need this or that. And so that, that, that basically getting uh, to go to another sort of playwright's idea that, uh, the, the two worst things that can happen to a person are not getting what they want and getting everything that they want. That's a, yeah, that was Oscar Wilde's quote, yes. right? The, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, it sounds like it's in my wheelhouse for sure. It's, it's not only is it something I write about, but it's something I've lived to a certain extent <laughs> over the last five years. <laughs> Yeah, it's 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 weird too because like there's success and then there's also like catastrophic success, right? Yeah. Like there uh there's like the hey, you worked really hard and after 30 years you got promoted to full professor at insert university and then there's the youngest professor in the history of Harvard or something. Do you know what I mean? There's there's like yeah. regular success and extreme success. And you certainly had ex extreme success relative to what we do, right? Like there are yes. many Silicon Valley people who nobody has ever heard of who would be like, that's not catastrophic success. That's not even success at all, right? So it's, yeah. all this stuff is relative, but, but it does strike me that there's, there's getting what you wanted and then there's getting more than you could have ever possibly dreamed of. Well, the, the best, so the best description of this phenomenon I heard uh, it was actually relayed to me by by Will Smith when we were working on the book together because I, I asked him about this. Like, you know, after Subtle Art, it blew up so big and so fast. And as you know, you know, we've, we've talked about off, off like privately, uh, yeah. you know, it, it fucked with me for a while. And I was asking him about it and he, he told me, he said, you know, I've never, I didn't experience that, but he said it's such a common thing in show business. And he said that Quincy Jones used to call it altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. And he used to say that, you know, when he was a music producer, he would see that, uh, you know, the same way when you climb a mountain, you need to like stop and acclimate at certain levels to like yeah. prevent yourself from passing out. If you just go straight to the peak, you get altitude sickness and you, you fall off and kill yourself. And, uh, and I, I love that analogy. Like, it makes a lot of sense to me. There's like an acclimation process of cert, like certain levels of success that you go through. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Well, one of the things Tennessee Williams is talking about in, in the essay, he's talking about like when he was sort of in the thick of it, he'd blown up, he's working on, he was like, I lived on hotel room service. And he was like, <laughs> how, how, how fundamentally abnormal that was. It's like great food every night, delivered right to your door like you don't clean it up you don't worry about where it came from you didn't worry about waiting in line like just like every part of it is stripping the just minor inconveniences and struggle of life and that that is fundamentally warping and unnatural and not good for you yeah and not only that you're replacing it with these like grand existential struggles of like do i deserve this mm -hmm. <laughs> what if what if i fuck up and lose everything what if i i just got lucky you know so it's uh you almost i found myself at a certain point like longing for those kind of dull quotidian struggles and concerns Interesting. yeah it's it's funny like uh growing up like just specifically of room service like like i was under the impression that like if we ordered room service in a hotel, it would like bankrupt as a, us as a family. Do you know what I mean? Like, like my parents, my, the idea that one could just could do this and should do this, you know, was inconceivable to me. And then, you know, you get to a place where uh, 
hey, actually, it makes more financial sense to just order room service than go downstairs and uh, to, to avoid all the inconveniences that we're just talking about. And then it, it does, though, it skews your sense of what's like normal and not normal. And maybe that stuff is actually important in terms of being a grounded person. Yeah. I know. So I'm friends with Derek Sivers and he, I know that he, he had a catastrophic success. He sold his, his company for 30 or $40 million or whatever. And he said that he developed a practice. I don't know if he still does it, but for a number of years, he would make a point to once a year fly, fly coach somewhere, stay in like a dingy hostel, yeah. you know, eat trashy street food, you know, basically put himself on the same budget that he had when he was 20 years old. Um, and just do that for like four days. They remind himself of like, okay, this is, this is normal life. Yeah. <laughs> you know, don't lose touch with it. Well, there's, there's a, there's a passage in one of Seneca's letters where he says like, we should do that every month. He said, you should like wear your worst clothes, eat the worst food, you know, sleep on the floor in your house. And he said, the point of that, it, it wasn't just like play acting or anything. He was like, the point was that he was saying that one of the, one of the costs of success is actually not security, but a kind of fear because you're afraid mm -hmm. of losing all the things that you're really comfortable with. Right. Yep. And he's like, you want to, you want to get comfortable with the way that, by the way, most people alive currently live. You know what I mean? Like you, you, yeah. it's, it's very survivable what you're afraid of, but you're afraid of it because it's unfamiliar to you because you've distanced yourself from it. And he said the whole point of this sort of practicing poverty and adversity was to be able to say to yourself at the end of that exercise, is this what I was so afraid of? You still go back to your regular or your good life, but you're not, you're not waking up in the middle of the night going, what if I get robbed? What if I get canceled? What if I fall off? Because you, you go, the worst case scenario is I just go back to how things used to be. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, the, I, I just pulled up the essay, and um, uh, I, I'd be curious what you think of this. Ten Tennessee Williams says, security is a kind of death, I think, and it can come to you in a storm of royalty checks beside a kidney-shaped pool in Beverly Hills or anywhere <laughs> at all that is removed from the conditions that made you an artist, if that's what you are intended to be. Ask anyone who has experienced the kind of success I am talking about, what good is it? <laughs> Well, that, that's the perennial question, right? Is, is like, is too much comfort, does it, does a certain amount of discomfort a prerequisite for good art? Yeah. And I think that's definitely open for debate, but it's, uh, there might be something to it. Well, have you found it hard to be creative or disciplined or to do the, the uncomfortable thing when you are not doing it for any need or is it actually better because you're doing it only when and because you want to do it i think now so i kind of look at you know my post catastrophic success life in two phases i think that the the original phase was actually motivated in hindsight it was motivated a lot by fear and it was mm -hmm. that that fear was or maybe not fear but like insecurity and i think a lot of that insecurity was like this might be my 15 minutes, say yes to everything, do everything, Sure. Uh, you know, because it might not come around again. And, you know, I think that's a reasonable position to take. I don't necessarily regret it, but it did lead to a period of kind of overloading on projects that I wasn't, some of them I, I, I enjoyed a lot, but it wasn't, you know, if you put me in a vacuum and said, what do you want to do with the next three years? It wasn't necessarily what I would have chosen. Mm. Um, I, it was kind of more, it was the stuff that was coming to me rather than me sitting down and deciding what I was going to pursue. And then, you know, unsurprisingly, that period le led to a pretty intense burnout about a year ago. And I took six months off. And I think in those six months off, I kind of reached that conclusion that you just said, where I'm like, wait a second, I'm fucking rich and successful. Like, I don't need to do anything I don't want to do. 
<laughs> and and since then, I feel like I'm in a really good spot psychologically. <laughs> Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something we're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it, all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it till I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. I think uh, taking six months off it's the, the prospect of that seems very scary to me. I, mm -hmm. it, it, financially, it makes no sense that that would be scary, right? Like I, yeah. I, I haven't thought about money the last six months, right? So I don't know, uh, I don't know why that would be scary to me. There's probably relevance is probably something that scares people. And then maybe there's even a like, if I stop doing it, will I, lose the ability to keep doing it like will 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 the skills get rusty or the magic stop or some something like that yeah there there was definitely a lot of insecurities around it and and i'll, I'll be honest like the first two months or so it was really difficult and it, it for a lot of those reasons i was like oh, like i it felt kind of like I was burning my career to the ground, yeah. um, which in hindsight was a very irrational feeling. But, you know, a lot of the thoughts you just mentioned were absolutely in my mind quite a bit. But I, I think, especially, you know, in the career that we're in, like the thing that I come back to is if I think about what, you know, I don't know, if you're a fan of, the band tool like tool went 15 years between releasing albums right and i i listened to that album the day it came out like i didn't stop being a tool fan i didn't stop being excited for their next album because they didn't put anything out for 15 years and so you kind of forget that like when people like you not only not only are they willing to wait but they might even be more excited if you go away for a while and then come back uh and and honestly, I, I have to say, coming back after those six months, it doesn't feel like I really, like it took a little bit of time for things to kind of ramp up again, maybe like a month, but it doesn't really feel like I lost anything. Well, ob objectively, when a band takes uh, a big break between albums, um, when they come back, there's, like in the case of Tool, 15 years of people discovered the band Tool. Yeah, maybe yep. some people outgrew the band tool, although probably not really that many. Um, but a bunch of people who were five when they took a break are now 20, you know? <laughs> but you don't think about it that way. You don't think about every year kids graduate from high school, every year kids graduate from college, every year X, Y, or Z happens, and those people become part of the pool of your potential fan base or, you know... Uh, customers or whatever the thing that you're thinking about but instead we we think only of the sort of but are are the people who know about me right now going to forget about me there's kind of a narcissism to it there there definitely is there's like there's a little bit of like i'm the center of because all these people are the center of my universe they i must be the center of their universe yes. you know uh <laughs> right right yeah yeah, uh, it's 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 also funny. Uh, this would be a stoic concept too. Is like the way it is framed to you determines whether it feels, uh, you know, good or bad. So like, if you had cancer and you had to take six months off to get chemotherapy, you'd be like, I'm so excited to get back to my career. I'm going to fight for it. Blah blah blah. You, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't be thinking oh, I can't believe I ruined my career by taking six months off. 
But if you voluntarily take the same period off, you're like, I'm never going to recover from this. Everyone will forget me, etc. It's like uh, the way we frame the event, whether it's something in our control or not in our control, like when it's objectively outside of our control, we understand it just is what it is. But yeah. when, when we're choosing it, then then we load it up with this sort of moral judgment about whether we should be doing it or not do it. Yeah, and there, there's a lot of kind of baked in ass deep seated assumptions around laziness and you know productivity and you know your your value as a human. Like if you're just sitting around playing video games every day, like you know you're wasting your life. And right. um, that you know you wrestle with that as well. Um, it's funny too. Like I, one thing that kind of surprised me about this year coming back it, because it's, it's, you know, it's things have dropped off a little bit the last few years. There's traffic is lower. Engagement is lower. You know, it's my books yeah. have been out for four or five, six years now. Um, so obviously there's less excitement, less engagement out there in the world and, and I'm doing new things. And, and I realized that like, I actually, I like being, I don't want to say the underdog, but like, I like being, uh, having, having to like claw, claw my way back up again. I don't if, mm. if that makes sense. Like that, it, it feels, it's a much more comfortable position for me psychologically than being like, feeling like I'm on top of the mountain, desperately trying to stay up there. And, um, like I, I enjoy the climb and the process and, and I kind of enjoy, I almost, in, I almost relish the idea that, that maybe people don't expect me to s stick around or something. I don't know. Well, so, so philosophically, is it wasting your life to sit around and play video games? Like what's your, what's your take on that? Like you could literally never work another day in your life. You could only do, you know, sort of pleasure seeking activities. Why, why wouldn't a person just do that? What's the argument for doing it or not doing it? Uh, well, I mean, I think you would have to attach a moral argument to, to some sort of like productivity or creativity, which I think there is a strong moral argument for that. I, I came to the conclusion that I am just not constitutionally a person. I'm not built to not be productive. Like it just mm. some amount of productivity really makes me happy. Um, sure. It's just a question of what that productivity is. Um, but I, I definitely do know people and have seen people who certainly seem completely able to sit around and play video games for the rest of their life and not feel any, like any pangs of guilt or <laughs> existential dread or anything. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I kind of go back and forth on that question. I don't, I, I don't know, honestly. What do you yeah, think? I mean, if if, if a person has a gift, like an ability to do a thing, putting money aside, you know, if their work is a positive good for the world or improves other people's life, like to what extent is that person obligated to do that thing? Yeah. I don't know. It's yeah. A tricky I, question. I don't know either. I mean, you, you know, there's, you could come at it from both angles that it's the, the in, increasing the social good is the moral imperative or the autonomy and the fulfilling of the, the individual's desires, the moral imperative, and, you know, who knows, but like, you could probably argue for a thousand years about it. Yeah. It's like, you don't <laughs> owe anyone anything. And yet you also owe people. It's like, it, like both things are both simultaneously true, make perfect, like intuitive sense. And there's probably a moral a strong moral argument that would feel convincing in both directions. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think ideally you get to a place where not like you do the work because it's your duty. It's the role sort of chosen for you by random circumstances and luck and all these things. And you get to a place where you actually, you find the way to do it and think about it for, through which it is both challenging, but also enjoyable and pleasurable to you at the same time. So basically it comes down to this sort of idea of balance or moderation that's probably the sweet spot. You don't have to make yourself, you know, uh, a mule that works itself to death on behalf of other people. And yet also indolence and laziness and purposelessness is probably not actually in the long run, 
the happiest or most fulfilling way to live. Yeah, I, I also, I, I don't know. I, I struggle to really think that, that people can do that for an extended period of time while being a, a, an emotionally healthy person. Like it seems like that the only way that that is a sustainable lifestyle is if there's something that they're running from or avoiding or burying in themselves. Um, you know, cause I think about like my six months off, you know, I, I dicked around for the first month or so, but then I was like, you know what, you know, cause the, the period of 20, 2017 to 2021, I worked so insanely hard. I was traveling so much. My, my health, sure. like I basically got fat and like was unhealthy and out of shape and, and, you know, I'm approaching 40. And so those are things I'm like, I need to, I need you to get this shit together. So I actually spent most of those six months just working out, hiring a health coach, getting my diet straightened out, you know, cutting back on drinking, uh, lost a bunch of weight. So in a way, it was like I was still being productive. It was just I was being productive on something very like personal and individual that I had neglected for a long time. Well, there's time. that uh, Abraham Lincoln thing. He, I, it doesn't actually sound like something he said, but maybe he did. But about like if you're supposed to chop down a tree, you know, you spend most of the time sharpening the axe. There's an argument that actually yep. if you're, if you're going to do this over a long period of time, uh, if you want to do it without burning out or hurting yourself, or if you actually want to be, you know, sort of, uh, metaphorically sharp, you have to spend, you had to spend some time stepping away, getting in shape, taking care of yourself, getting your priorities straight so that what you brought back to the work was the best version of yourself. Yeah, that, and that certainly feels true. I feel more energetic and motivated than I have in probably seven or eight years. What do you, why do you think your health suffered? Do you think it was, you just didn't have the energy to focus on it? Do you think it was like, why was that happening? Cause it's not like you were, you were working 20 hours a day in a coal mine. Like I'm sure you could have figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was a combination of things. I think the primary one is it, there's, so it's two things. One, I think a lot of people can relate to. And then, and then one was maybe a little bit more specific and individual to me, but the one I think most people can relate to is that I had a set of habits that you can get away with when you're 25, you can get away with when you're 30, but by the time you're 35, you can't really get away yeah. with it anymore. And so I think that there would have, even if I, my career wasn't going through kind of this crazy phase. There would have had to be some sort of reevaluation there of some basic lifestyle habits that would have had to be done. It probably would have been much simpler um, and, and less drastic than it ended up being, but uh, you know, it would have had to happen anyway. The second thing is just, I really, I really overloaded myself uh, over, you know, 2018, 2019, 2020. Uh, just really overloaded myself with work. Like I said, it kind of came back to like yeah, just yeah. saying yes to everything. Um, I did. I wrote three books at the same time. I did a movie. I did uh, an audio original. I at the same time I was doing a weekly newsletter. Um, I was doing speaking tours. I mean, I think I, I think 2018, 2019, I was on the road like five months a year. Um, and so when you're when you're on the road constantly, you're working like seven days a week, uh, you're eating right. room service all yeah, the yeah. time. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and so you're, you're eating the $40 burgers. Like you're showing up jet lagged. You've got an event the next day. You're, you've got to like write an article that night and you're like, fuck it. I'm going to order the $40 burger and uh, you're not sleeping well. You know, so it, it compounded a lot of the problems that were already there. And to your point about keeping the ax sharp, um, I think it really started to weigh down on my energy levels, my, uh, my ability to focus, my ability to, to just do excellent work. Um, and so it was, you know, I started to try to kind of address it even before I took the time off, but, uh, I lost a little bit of weight, but like once the six, you know, once I knew I was going to take an extended period of time off, I was like, okay, let's hit the gym. Let's eat some salad. 
let's 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 do this well, shit. It's, it's funny because <laughs> uh, I've talked about this before. I think a lot of people think that like having a family or being like homebound or or all these things that they hold you back. And in some in some respects, that's true. I think one of the things they hold you back from is kind of exactly what you went through, which was this sort of untethering or fundamental imbalance of having the ability to say yes to so many things. I mean, obviously, look, there's plenty of people who have yeah. who have kids and houses and you know a lawn to mow and all these things that and they neglect all that because you know they're going on sales calls or you know they're they're building a company. But I think. In a weird way, what you there, there's that Flaubert line about being sort of ordered in your life, so you can be disordered in your work. You know, like uh, you can be chaotic and experimental. Mm -hmm. I think it's it's hard when there's no good reason not to spend five months on the road to to not spend five months on the yeah. road, right? Or or you're like the only thing holding me back from doing this is whether I say yes or no, it's hard to say no to, to the, the coolness of the thing, the financial remuneration of the thing, the guilt of not doing, et cetera. I think like to me, the only way to do a lot sustainably is to find a way that it slots in in a somewhat balanced or ordered life and you're doing it consistently day to day. You're acclimated at the altitude as opposed to this more, which I think is more common, the uh, the sort of like binge and purge mentality uh, that that people get sucked into. Yeah. yeah, I think it's it's you know I, I forget if it's like Parkinson's law, but it's like the the the, the amount of time a task requires will mm -hmm. shrink or expand the the amount of time given to it. And I think a, a lot of the reason that that is true is that the more commitments you have the more you're forced to think about prioritization organization the more seriously you have to take you know your discipline like if you're at a event and people invite you out to the bar yeah. after you know after afterwards like you say no um you know like you said it's it's when you when you have kind of this blank slate to to kind of run with everything uh, and that's something that I've just always, I've struggled my entire life. Like I, I like, I like a yeah, little yeah. bit of chaos. I like, uh, I tend, my personality is such that when I do something, I tend to overdo it. Um, and I've always been that way. And I think I just did it with, with work and, and all these cool, cool opportunities. And, uh, and yeah, now it's like, it's time to like pull the reins in and, Sort yeah, if, if you want to talk about catastrophic success, I, I read this thing about Lin Manuel Miranda when um, when Hamilton came out. You know, so the biggest play in the world, it blows up at this totally you know uh, insane level. But he had right as the play was starting, his first kid was born. So you know, backstage after every night, people would be like, "We're going here, we're going here, and this celebrity's coming, this celebrity's coming," and he was like. I have to get home to the baby because the baby's going to wake yeah. up in the middle of the night. And if I don't get X hours of sleep, I won't. Uh, and, you know, assuming that I'm going to be involved in that, I'm not going to be able to perform the way that I need to perform the show. And his point was actually that, you know, having kids instead of destroying his artistic life, it actually saved his artistic life in that uh, unusual circumstance because it forced him to be normal. And I think that's something that people who haven't had extreme success don't quite understand how inherently destabilizing and unnerving and, you know, tempting it is. Uh, and that whatever you have to pull you back down to earth, whether it's, you know, hey, I'm training for a marathon or I just had kids uh, or X, Y, or Z um, is really, really, really important. Yeah, and and I think what you also don't realize, and I know I had to learn this the hard way, is that you you kind of convince yourself you're like, oh my god, an after party and this celebrity is going to be there, and you kind it's of work. I got, I should do it. It's work. Convince. 
Yeah, like you convince yourself, you're like, oh, meeting this person is actually a really great networking opportunity, and it's going to be great to know this person, and and who knows what sort of people they can introduce me to. And uh, after a certain number of years, you just start to realize that it's 99% of it is completely pointless and just like ego gratification. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a tricky thing. We should talk about that because I, I'm of two minds of it. So one, COVID happens and that goes away for like a year, right? There's no impromptu mm -hmm. coffee meetings or big dinner parties or events or whatever. And I don't know about you, but my career didn't suffer for that, right? Like, and my personal happiness no. went up, yeah. my professional, you know, productivity went up. So it's like, it's a lie you're telling yourself that you should do this for work that you need yes. to do. It's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I, I, I think you and I are in the same boat in this regard. Like it, you always talk about how books punch above their yes. weight in terms of networking and, and the rooms that you get invited into. And, and as I think as young authors experiencing a lot of success for the first time, like that is very exciting and a little bit intoxicating at first you're like oh my god like this so and so wants me to like come to his house or like have dinner or whatever and you're just like oh this is crazy like i can't believe this is happening and uh and then nothing comes of it like it's it's you meet them they're normal people they like ask you the same questions a hundred people email you and ask you every day and it's like you just have dinner and life goes on and the funny thing is the only actual kind of famous person that I, the, the famous person I did end up working with and doing a big project with and making a bunch of money with was Will Smith. And he just did it the old fashioned way. His team reached out to my agent and said, Hey, is Mark available for a meeting? Yeah. <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> there are no dinner parties. There are no after parties. There was like no like schmoozing at the, you know, the cocktail lounge or whatever. Like it was just classic being well, professional. The, the other part that's <laughs> tricky for me though, is I go, okay, okay. Like what were some pivot points in my life? They were, they came through relationships that I have. Someone I met who opened up this door. So, so it's like, it, it, it's this sort of co contradictory thing, which is most of the stuff is totally extraneous, not important. That's why you should have a no new friends policy, you know, just stick to your stuff, say no to all this stuff. And yet if I had actually kept that rule my whole life, I probably wouldn't be here. And so that's the trickiness and the, the insidiousness of it where you're like, but I should do this because you never know what it could lead to. But I think it's, so I think there's a difference there because when you said yes to those opportunities, you weren't Ryan Holiday, the successful and famous author. You were Ryan Holiday, like the college dropout. Yeah trying to get your foot in the door, you know, where, whereas I think, you know, for me, it was, it was like the, the success from the books was opening these doors. And then I got, ex got excited and ran in and I was like, Oh wait, why am I here? I'd rather, I'd rather be at home watching Netflix with my wife. Totally. Like <laughs> totally. Uh, yeah. For yeah. me, it's like, um, you know, I, I speak at events, which is a part of the way I make my living and then I'll get invited to, well, this one doesn't pay, but it's the coolest event you've ever heard of in your life, you know, and the following people will be there yeah. and they go, uh, you know, you know, like, I feel like a <laughs> dick saying, like, I only go to the ones that I'm working at. At the same time, I find that rules, really bright and clear rules are super important as far as discipline is concerned, because it eliminates the gray area the exceptions that you'll make that, you know, inevitably when I do agree to one of those events, I'm like, oh yeah, this is why I have that rule. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm with you on that. <laughs> so you talked about Parkinson's law earlier. Um, I'm curious about this movie that you did about the subtle art, because if there's any part of the American economy that embodies Parkinson's law, it has been, in my experience, the Hollywood production process, which is like, <laughs> like, uh, like conspiracy got optioned in the summer of 2017, and it still hasn't gone into production. But it almost always looks like it's about to, 
and I'm like, I've written five books since you guys have uh, have been working on this. How, how does this work? <laughs> you know, was the process maddening for you or was it exciting or how, how did you take it? Uh, so I went, when, when the, the book first got optioned, one of the first things my agent told me was she said, these things pretty much never get made. So yeah. don't get your hopes up. And I was like, cool noted. Um, and I kind of did, you know, I had zero expectations going into it. It did end up getting financed. It did end up getting made. I mean, it took two to three years longer than I think everybody said it was going to take, but it did end up happening. And I, I really just kind of kept those same low expectations the entire time. You know, it was like, I knew the the production company had optioned it. They had, they've got a history of doing documentaries. Um, they've turned a lot of books into documentaries. They do a good job. So I was like, okay, you know, it'll be fine. As long as it's not embarrassing. And as long as it's not like, <laughs> as long as it's not like agonizing and waste a bunch of my time, then, then cool. And so, the shooting process was a ton of fun. The creative process was fun. It was all fine. Um, but yeah, it's that industry. One thing I've learned from that industry, not, you know, this, this project a little bit, but, you know, dealing with some other options of optioning of my IP, Hollywood seems to, it's like the more they tell you they love something and they can't wait to do it, the less likely it is to happen. <laughs> It's this bizarre world where like everybody constantly has to kiss each other's ass and like inflate each other's egos. And, and I can't really, I think like part of it, the cynical explanation for that would just be like, it's just, it's a bunch of narcissists who uh, are running around with cameras but I also like, I also kind of understand that the, the reality of that industry requires a little bit of that because it is such a small inbred industry and you never know if, you know, this producer or this cinematographer that, you know, you had lunch with or whatever ends up being the person who brings you into the next film or introduces you to your next director or, um, you know, can f make the connection to finance your next project. And so everybody has to be like completely inauthentically nice and, and excited to each other all the fucking time. And as a person who very much prides myself on being blunt and a little bit, uh, curmudgeonly, um, I just feel so out of place in these meetings. Like I've never felt more out of place than on like conference calls with, Hollywood studios because everybody just tells everybody else how amazing they are and how, how great everything is going to be. And I'm just, I'm the asshole in the corner. Who's like, okay, so have we yeah. done anything yet? Is there any deliverable What's yet? That, that <laughs> you know, the like, sort of maker manager distinction and almost 99.9% .9 of the people in that sphere are, are not makers. They're managers or paper pushers or, you know, agents of some kind. And so they're, there is this, if you're a person who, who exists in a world where you sit down and make stuff and then that stuff goes out into the world because you do a podcast or you, you make videos that you post on the internet, or, to then go, it's like you, you've, you entered a world without gravity suddenly. You know what I mean? It's just, you're like, what? Yeah. Nothing, yeah. None of the things I'm so used to taking for granted work here and it's maddening. It, it's a bizarre world where I think it's even more, you know, it, books, you know, coming from a background of blogging, books still make sense because, you know, just the, the process of consuming a book, you know, there's a lot more yeah. depth to it. It takes a lot more investment. There's a heritage behind books. There's a prestige behind books. And I do think film still has a lot of that prestige. Like there's, there's kind of, there's something very notable and, and kind of gets everybody's ears to perk up when you say that yes. you made a movie, but it's funny because I I've been on, you know, now we're doing all the, the marketing and promotion cycle. Um, and I've been on some of these calls with them and they're trying, I can tell they're trying to get yeah. me hyped up. Um, and, and, and at one point they told me, they're like, they're like, Mark, you realize like tens of thousands of people are going <laughs> to see this movie. Tens and, of thousands. And I'm like, 
I, yeah, I'm just, it's killing me because I'm like, okay, you realize like if, if you just take my YouTube channel, which is like a very small thing of everything that I do, this movie, it's paying me less money. It's going to be see, seen by fewer people. I have less creative control. I, I have no control over the monetization or the promotion of it. Um, you know, like, how is this a good deal in any way, shape or form for me? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's ultimately, um, I think there's a little bit, there's, they're a little bit stuck in the past, um, of it, very much in the same way the publishing industry often is of, of kind of like, you know, we're Hollywood, you should be so thankful to be here. You're so, you know, you should feel lucky, um, and not really you know, considering that, that the reality of my career or a career like yours is, is just completely different. Like they, they, they can't even account for it in their usual, their usual calculations. Yeah, so. It's, um, it's also interesting because, uh, obviously when you, when you wrote, um, when you wrote the subtle art, it's sort of a screed against self-help where it's a different kind of self-help and the mm -hmm. movie sort of is a continuation of that. And yet also like, it is more self-helpy in the sense that it's like, oh, you can't read a book? Here, watch the movie. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you can't be yeah. bothered to read. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, and this it was, so this is the funny thing about it too, is is I really like how the film turned out. Like, it, it, you know, I, the creative process was really enjoyable from beginning to end. And, and filmmaking is so different from, anything i do uh in the process and the like it's so collaborative and involves so many moving pieces and and there's like dozens of people and they all know a little bit of what it's going to look like but nobody seems to know completely what it's going to look like and it was a very fascinating and, and interesting experience to go through it and i do think that the movie turned out great you know one of our goals going into it when I had early conversations with them, as I said, like, you know, I think one of the reasons subtle art worked was it was very disruptive to the self-help genre. It kind of like threw a curveball at a lot of people in situations that they weren't used to like seeing a curveball in a book. And I said, I'd love to do that with the movie. Like it kind of take a documentary about a self-help documentary and just flip it on its head and then like do a bunch of wacky shit that kind of surprises people. And we did that. And, uh, it, it's, so the creative part of it, I, I love, and it was fun. And in a vacuum, I would gladly shoot another one and make another one. But it's, it is that the, the industry is so anachronistic and, um, and just alien to me. I don't, I really feel, I told my agent, I'm like, I am a tourist in this industry. Like, I don't, I feel like I'm in China yeah. or something and I don't speak the same what, language. <laughs> what, do you, what do you feel like you have been trying to disrupt in self-help? Like it, it's, it, it is weird. Like you write a book and then it, it gets sort of branded as that, but that's not, I, I don't, th mm -hmm. I think there's a very specific type of person who sits down and is trying to write a self-help book. And I don't think either of us is that person. But I certainly have no problem with people who like self-help books liking my stuff. And I certainly have no co problem with the concept of people helping themselves. But it does seem like you, you there's something you're striking against that you don't that you feel like is false or untrue or misleading in self-help. What what is that to you? To me, it's I, I feel like a lot of the traditional self-help industry is it's optimized for making people feel like they're changing and not sure. actually changing. Uh, and I think especially when you get a lot of high priced products and seminars and stuff involved in manipulative marketing yes. tactics and the fact that most, most consumers of self-help are uh, vulnerable people and, and emotionally difficult spots in their lives. Like I think there's a real ethical issue in the industry that I've always had a, a chip on my shoulder about and you know it's it's i think a lot of it too is just offering more practical and better advice um you know i look at like you me and james clear i feel like we're all kind of hammer not hammering on the exact same thing but we're kind of in the same 
territory and that, you know, it's the classic, the classic narrative in this industry was always like, these three tips will change your life this yes. weekend. You know, give me $5,000 and come to this seminar and by Monday morning, you'll be a completely new person. And it's like, uh, you know, I, I think you and I have been kind of hammering on the, the, you know, life is actually very yeah. difficult and struggles persist for a long time and there's, there's no escaping it. And I think James has been kind of hammering on the change is actually extremely gradual and it happens. It's almost imperceptible over a long period of time. Um, and, but I think out of the three of us, my, my writing style is just the most like layman and uh, like, it's like a, the, if a random person who never reads a book is going to pick, like read one of our books, it'll probably be mine. Um, and it, and it's, so I, I think I get lumped into that category a lot, much more, a lot more than you guys do. Um, even, even though we're kind of like banging well, on the kind same of this, drum. Um, <clears throat> there's like a conflict of interest in self-help, which is that there's clearly a lot of people who need help. Right. And, uh, yeah. And, and therefore delivering that help is potentially lucrative. Um, but the most lucrative thing you could do would be to give them what feels like help, but it's not actually help, right? So like what you're just saying, it's like yep. telling most of the time what people need to hear is not the same as what they want to hear. And so if you're a self-help artist, uh, a self-help artist is probably what you should call because it it's similar to a con artist, I feel like. If you tell people what they want to hear, there's a much larger audience uh, for you than if you tell people what they need to hear or stepping even back further, if you simply say what is true, right? And so I think that yeah. that is probably what I think both of us are reacting against. Like The Secret is the ultimate self-help book in that it, it managed to yes. reduce down to its essence exactly what people wish was true but is fundamentally not true, uh, and and therefore sold the probably the most copies of any self help book ever written. Yep. Yeah, and it's in, and not only that, but I think <laughs> the saying what is true is actually far more difficult because it's you have to wrap. You know, you have to wrap the the uncomfortable truth in something that is shiny and and sexy and 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 a lot more palatable. You know, you almost have to like give give them sugar to make yeah. the medicine go down. Um, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's been yeah, it's just it's it's a a mission or a cause that I've had for pretty much since the beginning of my career and. Uh, and I don't see any reason to stop anytime soon. I don't know. It, it keeps it keeps me fired up. It keeps me pissed off <laughs> when I see a lot of this stuff out there, and I, I just feel like I need to like be the wet blanket. Um, oh, I I was gonna say something. I remember now. Um, you know, relating to your point of like telling people what feels good, I think there's kind of a an inherent not bias, but like. Our, our mind plays a trick on us. Like it, when we have an experience that's extremely emotional, a side effect of that is that we tend to assume that it must be mm. very meaningful. And so I think what a lot of self-help content does is it's very good at, at, at triggering an emotional response and then telling the person like, look how emotional you are. You just, you just had this sure. life changing moment. And, and then, pe but people don't realize that it's, you know, a, Emotions and identity and behavior change are actually two completely different things. Um, and so, yeah, I just feel like it's a magic trick that has just been used over and over and yeah, over again. It's, um, it's also like, so I've noticed that my books have gotten longer the more, I think I've talked about this before, but my books have gotten longer as I've gone. And I'm trying to be aware and on guard that I'm not getting more self-indulgent as I go on. And in fact, it it's, mm -hmm. it's because as I experience more and know more, I come to realize what you said, which is that the truth is a hard thing to say. It's a hard thing to wrap your head around. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing. And so in a, in a sense, in, in a way, the more kind of like delusional you are, egotistical you are, self-absorbed you are, 
it actually makes being successful as a self-help author easier because you dispense with nuance very easily and you just sort of self-assuredly reduce some super complicated thing down to nothing. Like I'll give you an example. I wrote this article when I was like 22 years old about dropping out of college, which I had just recently done, mm-hmm. right? And so I was, you know, somewhat biased towards it being a good idea. I was rationalizing it. I still think it's a, a relatively good idea. But as I've gotten older, when people ask me about dropping out of college, my no my answer is no longer like, yes, of course you should do it. Because I don't, I don't want the weight yeah. of that on me. And I have a much more nuanced, complicated take on it. And so I think like, if you're a simple minded person, you could write the secret or whatever. If you see reality as complicated and complex and people as complicated and complex, it becomes harder and harder to give advice generally because you no longer even accept such a thing as possible. See, Ryan, your problem is you yeah. have a conscience. If you didn't have so a conscience, easier. you could just write this. You, yeah, you'd sell so many more books. Like, <laughs> well, I, I actually do. People will go like, um, it, it's weird. You can't get credit for the the bad you don't do, but sometimes people will say things like, "Oh, you're just doing this to make money," and you're like, "If that's what I cared about, let me tell you how." easy that would be and i'm more books i would tell yeah it's like do you think i'd be studying seneca for 10 years if i just wanted to make money (laughs) yeah or you know you you look at these like uh you look at the ty lopez's or the andrew tates of the world these people that sort of blow up in this huge way online and make lots and lots and lots of money it's a combination of probably both ignorance and sociopathy at the same time that that allows them Mm -hmm. to to act and be that way and then um you know people who are not in a good place uh fall victim to that yeah it's it's really sad because the you know the nature of most people who come to self-help the the reason they have problems in their lives is because they are chronically unable to take responsibility for themselves and their own choices. And so what do they do? They find somebody, you know, like a Ty Lopez or an Andrew Tate who is willing to give them all the answers and relinquish them of the responsibility for making choices in their own lives. And it's like this, this kind of gross codependent relationship that happens at scale um, and then is monetized. Um, and I do think it's getting better. Um, I, I actually like not to pat us on the back, but like, I think you, me and James have like really, and I'd add, I'd add Tim yeah. Ferriss in there and, um, and a, and a few Cal other Newport people, does a great uh, like job. I really yeah, think there's a bunch of people. Yeah. I think, I think it's the trend is moving in the right direction. And I think the the material, what is kind of mainstream self help material, is is on average uh, becoming higher quality and becoming more helpful. Um, but yeah, there's still a lot of nonsense. Yeah, out I think there. I think it's good to see proof or to prove to the market that you can write thoughtful, uh, nuanced, you know, also entertaining, accessible stuff that makes a real difference for people that doesn't involve, you know, complete and total nonsense. And that deciding to go that way, let's say up market, isn't somehow like career suicide. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I think the video is good too, because like all, all, or the movie is great in this sense too, is like, like your point that like people read your books who maybe don't read a lot. I think that's great. I have also come further along in my under, in, in my sort of worldview, which is like, I am a person who who reads and learns via books, and that's simply mm-hmm. how it panned out for me. But that's not necessarily superior or better than someone who learns from podcasts or someone who likes TikTok. Like, I, I've come more around to the idea of like, 
what matters is the idea and the truth you're delivering. Um, you should go in whatever medium you're best in, but then also once something has worked, again, we're going back to this idea of obligation, but I think there's almost an obligation to try to translate it in as many mediums as possible to reach people who would not have accessed it through a book or whatever that other art form that you're in is. A hundred percent. And, and I mean, you, you and I, the vast, almost everything we write, it's not, these are not uh -huh. new ideas. I mean, you are very explicit sure. in that <laughs> these are not new. These are, these are thousands of years old, but you know, even a criticism I often get from people is they say like, well, you didn't come up with this. Yeah. Like this came from, this came from yeah. Nietzsche or whatever. And I'm like, well, no shit. But like, are you going to go read Nietzsche? Like it's, it's, I, I very much see uh, my job as, as, doing what you just said, which is kind of taking timeless, very important ideas and translating them in such a way that they're accessible uh, to the person who is never going to go to the philosophy section of a bookstore. Um, or not right now. But still like help right them. now they're not going to do it. Or you maybe know? not now. Yeah. I, I just wrote it. Yeah. I, yeah. But like, Oh, I was just going to say, but it just helped, you know, they can still get the benefit from the idea if it's delivered. I just a wrote a package. Daily Stoic email about this. It hasn't gone out, but I was saying, you know, people who are like, they'll go like, why would I need a coin to remind me that uh, I'm going to die someday? And, or like, why would I need to read one page of the Stoics every day? And my response is sort of like, maybe you don't, you know what I mean? Like, maybe you don't, but yeah. There is this narcissism in assuming that everything that is made must first and foremost be for you, right? Like, yeah, like maybe <laughs> me, you yes. are further <laughs> along than a high school dropout who just, uh, you know, went through an, uh, a, a soul crushing divorce and is trying to rebuild their life and doesn't know where to start or somebody who just you know, had a major health scare and they want this, like, like not everything is for you. People are yeah. in very different places than you. I, I came to the Stoics through the actual Stoics, but I also did that in a college apartment in America that my parents were paying for, right? Like I had time and space yeah. and privileges and advantages that, and an education that not everyone does. And, and that's not to say that the people who read my stuff are, are stupid. It's in fact, many of them are very, very, very smart They're They've already read the originals and they are looking for a reminder yeah. of what's in the original. So the, the point is there is this kind of elitism and narcissism of going like, well, that's simple. I don't need that. And it's like, maybe you're right, but you are not everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, you know, not even where people are in their lives, but also just fundamental yes. personalities. Like some people need reminders often. Some people don't, some people have great memories. Some people don't, you know, it, it's, um, it takes all, all kinds, uh, in the world. And, and the thing too, about these concepts, you know, both the stoic concepts and these other philosophical kind of self-help concepts is right. you're never done with them. Like you're never, you never stop you're like, oh, okay, I got the gratitude thing figured out. Like, don't have to worry about that. No, it's it's like a it is a daily practice. Like, you have to do it repeatedly, and and like a muscle, you will lose it if you if you don't keep yeah, it up. Yeah, and and weirdly, I think even bouncing between the mediums is really helpful. So, your reader watch the documentary. You're a podcast person. Actually, try reading the book. I, I think you get different flavors and angles on the stuff by by being sort of multidisciplinary in how you, in how you learn about stuff and not just being an elite snob. Uh, it doesn't serve you <laughs> or anyone. And it's, it's super obnoxious. Yeah. All don't right. So snob. don't be that's, a snob. That's, that's what, that's what that's we've learned today. <laughs> That is That's the, today's lesson. Yeah. Don't well, be a snob. It, it's like to, to go to your <laughs> one thing not to give a fuck about is how other people consume their information or food yes. or lifestyle. Like, just like, I think we have a huge problem caring too much about what other people do in their private fucking lives. Yes. That I, and I run into that all the time. Like I'll do a, a reading recommendation list and 
and people will email me and they're like, well, I, I tried to read the first two books and I didn't enjoy them. Like, what should I do? And I'm like, then don't read them. It's fine. <laughs> There's the, like, there's no wrong answer here. <laughs> yeah, there's a Thomas Jefferson line he was saying about something. He's like, it neither breaks my leg or picks my pocket, right? That was his like sort of standard for what should be allowed yeah. or not. And I think that that's a that's a good way yeah. of thinking about it. Like, what do you care? I, actually, I, I saw a TikTok about this. Someone was just saying like, when someone tells you they like something, you don't need to tell them your opinion on that thing. You can just let them like that thing. And I was yeah. like, that's so great. And that's such a better way to live too. Like, why do I need, why is it important to me to let this person who likes something know that I think what they like sucks? Yeah, it doesn't make, it doesn't help well, anything. Uh, I think your stuff is great and uh, I'm pumped about the movie and uh, it's always fun to talk, man. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Good to catch up.